person. No one really has got to know Fred except for the young lieutenant over here. And I have to call him a young lieutenant still. I think I'm older than him. I just want to tell you, in closing, that Ewing Township is Fred. I'm going to butcher his last name, I have to tell you. Zabatoski. So was I okay, sir? All right. So, <clears throat> I, didn't, I don't want to know. I thought she married the guy in the end here. I think she went from a Zabatoski to a Wisconsin-Gosevich. Oh, my God. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you deserve a Medal of Honor for that. <laughs> I, and I couldn't spell my name, it was pretty easy, David Christian in first grade, so it took me a couple of years to learn that. I just want to say that Ewing Township produced one of the finest, one of the few, and Fred, Fred Zabatowski is everybody in the stand. He got up early this morning, put on a suit and tie or a shirt or a jacket or a cap. The Special Forces team here, the bike riders, you are, I am, we are, being looked on right now by Fred, and he's sending down his thank yous from heaven. God bless you, airborne ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Christian. Our next presentation will be by Sergeant First Class Keith McKinn, U.S. Special Forces, 5th Group. Sergeant First Class Kim is a Vietnam veteran and former Green Beret. He has a degree in speech communication from Metro College, Denver, Colorado. He is a professional, motivational, inspirational, and political speaker. He is a published author, an actor in church and community theater, and an amateur singer and poet. Sergeant First Class McKim's awards include the Silver Star with Valor, Bronze Star, and Purple Heart. In keeping with Keith's skill as an inspirational speaker, he has a very special presentation for us today on the history of the Star Spangled Banner. Please welcome Sergeant First Class Keith McKinnon. Thank you. There was a man, a lawyer named Francis Scott Key. I'm sure you've all heard about this. He wrote a poem that became a song a song you've all heard, and probably sung. In my youth, that song was printed on the inside front cover of all the hymnals in our churches. It's called the Star Spangled Banner. It's our song as Americans. We go to our churches, our schools. We go to professional, political, and public events, and we sing the words to this song. The words float through our minds and cross our lips. But most of us don't know what the words mean. We've never been taught what the words mean. Let me tell you a story. It was the War of 1812. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer in Baltimore. The Americans were engaged in a vicious war with the mother country, Britain. Because of the war, and the length of it, both sides had captured many prisoners. The Americans wanted to have a negotiation for an exchange of prisoners, and they approached the British with the idea. The British readily agreed, and they set a date. On the appointed date, Key was taken by rowboat out to the Admiral's flagship. Once aboard, negotiations began in earnest and very quickly ended with an agreement to exchange the prisoners on a one-for-one -one basis. Key was ecstatic with the success of his negotiations. The American prisoners were being held in ships, anchored about a thousand yards offshore. Key decided to go down into the ship, into the holds, to talk with the prisoners. When he arrived, he found a mass of humanity. The stench, said Key, was overwhelming. It was the smell of blood and the smell of sweat. It was the smell of rot and the smell of decay. It was the smell of death and the smell of fear. It was the smell 
of wounded men lying in their own waste. Key addressed the prisoners and said, Men, today I have successfully negotiated for your release. Tonight, you'll be taken out of these ships, out of this filth, out of your chains. And then he went back up on deck to make arrangements for their transfer to shore. The Admiral approached him and said, Sir, we have a problem. What problem, asked he. Well, the Admiral said, we have told these prisoners and the people here, if you don't lower that flag that you're so proud of, we are going to remove that fort, Fort McHenry, from the face of the earth. How are you going to do that, he asked. The Admiral said, if you will look to the horizon of the sea. He looked and he saw hundreds of dots. That, said the Admiral, is the British war fleet. All of the powder, all of the armament is being called upon to demolish that fort. Those ships will be here within striking distance in about two and a half hours. Those prisoners would have been released anyway. You can't do that, he said. That fort is filled with women and children, and it's not really a military fort. Don't worry, said the Admiral. We've left them a way out. What way, asked he. The Admiral said, do you see the flag above the rampart, above the fort? We've told the colonists if they will lower that flag, the shelling will stop immediately. We will know that they've surrendered and you will be back under British control. The flag he referred to was huge. It was 42 feet by 30 feet. Major Armistead, who commanded the fort, had ordered that it be made that large so that, in his own words, the British would have no trouble seeing it from a distance. Key went down into the hole to tell the prisoners what was about to happen, and they asked him, how many ships are there? How many? And he told them, hundreds. As the British war fleet drew near, Key went back up on deck. But before leaving the prisoners, he addressed them and said, Men, I will shout down to you what is happening as I watch. Twilight began to fall, and a mist hung over the ocean as it does at sunset when suddenly the British unleashed their power. The sound said key was overwhelming. So many guns were firing at once that there was no relief. And although darkness had fallen, the night was lit by the cannon fire. From down below, Key could hear the men shouting, where's the flag? Does the flag still stand? Tell us where the flag is. One hour, two hours three hours into the bombardment, and every time a bomb would burst near the flag, he could see the flag in the red glare of the bomb, and he would go to the hold and shout down, the flag still stands, she has not fallen. The admiral approached him and said, are you crazy? Are your people insane? Do you not know that this is a hopeless situation? Key said it was then that he remembered George Washington's words when he said, the thing that distinguishes the American patriot from all the peoples of the world is that he will die on his feet before he will live on his knees. The Admiral's face grew red with anger and he said, we have ordered every gun in the fleet to focus on that one point to bring down that flag. But there's something we don't understand. Our reconnaissance has told us that flag has been hit again and again and again, and yet it still stands. We don't understand that. But now, with every gun in the fleet focused on that one point, that flag will come down. The bombardment, said Key, was unmerciful. From down below, he could hear the men praying, God, keep that flag flying 
for last we saw it. Sunrise came, and a heavy fog held over the land. Rising above the fog was the rampart. And above the rampart was the flag, completely nondescript, in shreds. And the flagpole itself was at a crazy angle. Unknown to Key, Major Armistead and his men had shown such valor and such courage that they convinced the British high command that the fight for Baltimore would be bloody and much too costly. The Admiral ordered the fleet to withdraw and it sailed away. Key immediately went ashore and then he went into Fort McKinley to find out what had happened. And what he found was that flag had suffered multiple hits and it had fallen. But men, 